All right, let me pray so we can go home. <laughs> That's amazing. Goodness. Well, hey, good morning, church. It's so good to be with you. If we've not had the chance to meet yet, my name is Nick. I'm one of our pastors here, and I'm so excited to get into God's Word with you today. We've been studying in a series called Abide in Me since the beginning of January, John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, setting the last sermon that Jesus gave to his disciples around a table. And today is Palm Sunday. We're getting ready to head towards Easter. It starts the beginning of Holy Week. And as we prepare, I want to go back to John 13, where Jesus is starting the sermon with his disciples around a table. We're going to be in John chapter 13, verse 2. If you want to follow along today, all of the notes are available. If you just text the word notes to 68,000, uh, I'd love for you to be able to follow along. John chapter 13, verse 2. It starts this way. It says, it was during supper when the devil had already put the thought of betraying Jesus into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, that Jesus, knowing that the father had put everything into his hands, that he had come from God and that he was now returning to God, got up from the supper and he took off his outer robe and taking a servant's towel, he tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began washing the disciples' feet and wiping them with the towel which he had tied around his waist. Last week, we looked at the scripture and we looked at the amazing beauty that Jesus knew that God had put everything into his hands. I have nothing to prove in this moment. Knowing that he had come from God, I have intrinsic value, and that I'm going back to God. I'm, I'm fulfilling the purpose that I've been put here on earth to do. In light of all of knowing that, he gets up from the table and he takes the position of a lowly servant and he washes the feet of his disciples. What we talked about last week was this idea, and this is today's really a part two of the main theme of last week, that Jesus came as the humble, helpful servant of all. You want to know what the greatest in the kingdom of God looks like? It's the humble, helpful servant of all. And he puts on a master class, not of what he says, but what he does in this moment. And today I want to take a look at this passage again, and really the entirety of John 13, because at surface level, first glance, this is so beautiful and moving. And the more you read John 13, it just becomes more magnificent, if you ask me. Because in John 13, we see Jesus wash his disciples' feet, but we also get some depth and context into the feet that he's washing. Today, I want to show you two other characters that are introduced in John 13, how Jesus interacts with them, how they interact with Jesus, and what that means for us today. Because you see, the first disciple, there are two characters, two disciples that get mentioned by name in particular in John 13. And the first disciple is a guy named Peter. Now, if you didn't grow up in church, you're new to church, uh, you don't know a lot about the Bible, that's okay. Let me tell you about Peter and who Peter is. Peter is one of Jesus' disciples. He's actually one of Jesus' closest disciples. And Peter is a blue-collar working man. Okay? He's a fisherman. He spends all day on the boat fishing with his guys. Okay? So he's a little rough around the edges, but here's why you should root for Peter. Because Peter, when he gets a thought, he just speaks it into existence. Like I'm not actually concerned about all the repercussions of what I'm going to say, but it just comes from his head, out his mouth, into the world. And that's beautiful in so many ways. Like it's beautiful because here's what happens. When Peter first encounters Jesus, Jesus does this incredible miracle. And instead of going, wow, what an amazing miracle. This is cool. Peter looks at Jesus and the first thing come out of his mouth, he goes, be gone from me, Lord. Like I'm a sinful man. You are good. Be gone from me. Like he has the humility to look and it just, it comes pouring out of him. This is why you root for Peter, like the brutal honesty that he has when he sees things. And Jesus looks at him almost as if to say, okay, now I can use you. And he goes, Peter, come with me. I'm going to take you from fishing and I'm going to make you a fisher of men. Like from now on, I'm changing your purpose. Another place, uh, Peter is standing with the disciples and Jesus is teaching. And he says, hey, who do people say that I am? And all the disciples go, well, some say that you're Elijah. Others say that you're Moses. And he goes, yeah, okay. Who do you say that I am? You've been walking with me. You've seen me. Who do you say that I am? And Peter's the first one to speak. And he goes, you're the Christ. Like you are the, you are the one sent from God. You are the Messiah. And Jesus goes, Peter, I'm going to build my church upon you. You're my rock. Do you see this? It's, it's beautiful. And it gets him in trouble sometimes as well too. 
Because some of you know, if you don't think about what comes out of your mouth, you know that you can get into trouble. Just safe place, just honest learning together. Um, I relate to Peter. A couple weeks ago, I told my very pregnant wife, hey, don't take this the wrong way, but I don't even need to finish what was on the rest of that. You know that if you preface a sentence with that, it's 100% chance it's gonna be taken the wrong way. This was Peter, okay? Jesus is giving the scouting report. Hey, let me tell you what's gonna happen. We're gonna go into Jerusalem, and when we get there, I'm gonna be turned over to the religious officials, and when I get turned over, they're going to crucify me, and I'm gonna die. But on the third day, come on, I'm gonna rise again, and I'm coming back. And Peter, it says, pulls him aside silently and quietly to reprimand him. <laughs> you know how crazy that is? Can you imagine reprimanding Jesus? Hey, come here real quick. I know you're the savior of the world. Come here, I gotta tell you something real quick. And just pulls him over. <laughs> Jesus, stop talking that way. Don't talk like that. Come on, we're going to go do something. And Jesus looks at him, what does he say? Get behind me, Satan. Like, get behind me. Like, you don't even know the spirit that you're speaking out of right now. This is Peter in a nutshell. Jesus shows up at the table and he starts washing his disciples' feet. In verse five, he says this, watch this. Then he poured water into a basin and began washing the disciples' feet and wiping them with the towel which was around his waist. When he came to Simon Peter, he said to him, Lord, are you gonna wash my feet? Like, what do you think you're doing? Seriously, you're gonna wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you do not realize what I'm doing, but you will fully understand it later. Like, you don't even understand what I'm trying to do, but someday you're gonna get it and you're gonna see it. And Peter's response back to Jesus, as he says this, he says, Lord, you will never wash my feet. Like, never, you're not washing my feet. You might have washed Bartholomew's feet, because yeah, well, he's Bartholomew. Like, that, he might let you do that. You're not washing my feet. No way. And look at Jesus' response. He says, unless I wash you, you can have no part of me. We can have nothing to do with each other. Like, unless you let me do this for you. Here's what's so interesting. Jesus is speaking to something that we may not see on the surface. Because it's actually, it looks like humility, right? Like, Jesus, I know who you are. I know who I am. Don't wash my feet. Jesus still is speaking to a form of pride in Peter. Do you see this? So he speaks to him saying, hey, Peter, are you going to be too proud to let me wash your feet? Like if you're gonna to be too proud to not let, if you're gonna to be too proud and you won't let me wash your feet, then I can have nothing to do with you. I'm trying to give you something here. And Peter, being Peter then, once he's reprimanded, immediately goes, okay, well then wash my whole body, Jesus. Wash my head, wash my feet, wash my toes, everything. Get the Irish spring, let's do this thing. <laughs> and Jesus looks at me and says, you don't need me to wash your whole body. You can do that. I don't need to do that. What I'm talking about is you receiving something that only I can give you. Like, just receive what I'm trying to give you in this moment. And you would think Peter would get it. But a little later in the chapter, Peter's sitting around the table and Jesus is giving the scouting report again. Let me tell you what's going to happen. I'm going to be crucified and I'm going. In. And he says it this way. He says, where I am going, you cannot follow me now. But you will be able to follow me later. Like, you don't understand the path that I'm getting ready to take, the Jesus way that I'm walking. Someday you'll be able to get there and you'll see it. And Peter said, Lord, why can I not follow you right now? Like, I will lay down my life for you. Like, I'll die. Let's go do this, man. I'm ready. Let, let's make it happen. And Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? Really? I assure you and most solemnly say to you, before a rooster crows, you will deny me completely and disown me three times. And Peter does what you and I would do. We go, well, okay, whatever, Lord. Like, no, you don't. You, no, no, no. I have best of intentions. There's no way I'm going to do that. Well, if you know the story, fast forward a couple hours, Jesus is arrested. He's betrayed. He goes to the Garden of Gethsemane and he's taken from there to the courtyard of the chief priest. And it says that Peter followed at a distance. Jesus is being interrogated and Peter is standing back warming himself around a fire. And as he's warming himself, a servant girl comes walking up and says, whoa, hang on a sec. Weren't you, all, you were with Jesus, weren't you? You were with him. And he goes, little girl, I don't know you. Go away. Sorry, I was not with him. I don't know him. And then she comes back a second time a little later and she goes, no, you're from, you're a Galilean. Of course you were with him. And he goes, this girl's on drugs. I don't know her. I don't, I don't think he said that, but you know what I mean? Like, just, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. I disown, no, I don't know him. And then a third person comes. And on the third time, he finally has had enough. Cause you know this, right? Pride takes many different faces. For some it's anger. For others, it's fear. 
And so in this moment, he comes back and he goes, I don't know him. And it says that he actually cussed at the person that asked him that. And here's the beauty and the crazy part of the gospel. I say this to people all the time. You're not, or the Bible's not boring. You're boring. Read your Bible, okay? Because when you read this, it blows your mind. Because it says the second the rooster crowed, it hit Peter. Like he heard it and went, oh my gosh. And Luke's gospel records this. It says that wherever Jesus was sitting, I don't know how it happened. Wherever Jesus was sitting, it said that he looked up and looked at Peter. Like think about this. They make eye contact. Like I remember when I told you that you were going to get it wrong. Yeah, you were ready to come to death with me, really? And he stares right at him and it says Peter is filled with immense sorrow. And he turns and he runs out of the courtyard weeping. Now pause, have you ever washed somebody's feet before? Like literally, have you ever washed somebody's feet before? It is incredibly intimate. And it's a little awkward if you're, if you're honest, like if you're not used to the custom, it's, it's intimate and it's awkward because I'm actually getting down low and I'm taking your foot and I'm below you looking up at you and you're looking down at me and if I'm washing your feet, you're not doing anything other than just receiving. If I'm washing your feet, you're the, I'm the only person doing something. Jesus, don't miss this, sees Peter. He knows, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. Like, I know it. I can see it. I know that's where it's, what's going to happen. And I'm going to wash your feet anyway. And Peter, I know you have the best of intentions. And I know that you're so zealous for me and you want to do right. But I know that you're unknowingly going to get it wrong. Like that's gonna happen and I'm still washing your feet anyway. Can I tell you right now, that picture right there is a microcosm of Jesus's whole ministry, of everything that he does. When you see the people that were attracted to Jesus and who Jesus attracted, it's right in line. So like when you read scripture and you read the gospels and you see that Jesus was called a friend of sinners, like sinners felt comfortable in his presence. Think about that. He was a friend to Samaritans and to Roman sympathizers. So to those on the outside and those who willingly stepped away from our culture to go join the Romans. Remember when Jesus said, I have to go through Samaria. Like I have to, like I, it's good for me to go there. Jesus touched lepers. Think about this. He, many of you don't know, we don't know very many lepers, right? Like we don't know very many people that have leprosy. Think of how big of a deal this is. If I touch a leper, I'm ceremonially unclean. And Jesus touches someone who, let's be clear, if you have leprosy, you're not getting touched by anybody. So you just think of the power in that. When I touch you, I don't get dirty, you get clean. And I take your leprosy away. Jesus showing up to people who are in sexual impropriety and not just forgiving, but redeeming and restoring. You remember that story where Jesus shows up and they drag the woman caught out in adultery to him? And they say, what should we do? Should we stone her? She's guilty of sin. And Jesus goes, well, you could. But also, like, dude, check out the log in your own eye. Do you see this? Like, let those who have never sinned cast the first stone. And one by one, they get up and they walk out. And Jesus, to be clear, the only person who had never sinned, the only person worthy of picking up a rock and throwing it at this poor girl, looks at her and says, where are your accusers? Who condemns you? And she goes, well, they're not here. They're, they're gone. And he says, well, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Do you see this? That Jesus is drawn to people who are consistently getting it wrong. He looks and he says, no, I'm coming and I'm washing your feet anyway. That Jesus' consistency is always to say, hey, listen, I know you're not going to get it right. And I'm still choosing to wash your feet anyway. And not just wash your feet as a kind gesture, wash your feet because I believe there's more on the other side of this foot washing of meeting you as the humble, helpful servant of all than you even know. Because you know the story, many of you know the story, that Jesus is crucified, Peter is off in shame, but the story doesn't end there. That on the third day, Jesus, the victorious Christ, comes back from the dead and he rolls the stone away, saying, death, where is your sting, right? Grave, where is your victory? He stands there triumphant and a group of women come to come visit his tomb. And when they get there, they show up and an angel is sitting there. Fun detail, just because we have time, it's the 1130 service. Uh, fun detail, the angel is sitting in the tomb. You know how scary that would be? You show up at the tomb and you walk in, it's like, hey, what's up? And it just scares you half to death. And he, I told you, Bible's not boring, you're boring. Go read it, it's crazy. He shows up and they say, where's Jesus? He says, you're looking for the living among the dead. 
He's been brought back to life. He's here. And I have some instructions for you on behalf of Jesus. Go tell his disciples and Peter that he's back. Go tell him. Make sure you tell the disciples and Peter. He's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Go and tell his disciples and Peter. There are some commentators that believe that the gospel of Mark, which this comes out of, was written by Mark transcribing Peter's experience. Think about this. The level of detail that's put into this, it's as if Jesus, the risen Christ, it's as if his primary focus is, hey, make sure you invite Peter, because if you don't invite him, he may feel disqualified to come with y'all. Like, make sure that you tell him specifically, I want to see him. I want him to come and meet with me. I want him to come. And when he meets with Jesus, Peter comes back and Jesus looks at him and he says, do you love me? And he goes, Father, you know I love you. You, you, you know it. And he goes, good, feed my sheep. Like now I give you a hope and a future greater than this momentary shame that you're stuck in. Because listen, I washed your feet back then. I'm going to keep washing your feet today. And I invite you now to pick up a towel and come join the mission with me. You see this? We get insight into Peter, Jesus consistently coming, but we get insight into another disciple as well too. And you heard about him in the beginning, but we get more in John 13. There's another disciple around the table named Judas. Now, if you didn't grow up going to church, you know Judas. You've heard of Judas before. You've heard somebody called you Judas, or maybe you've never heard that before. I don't know, but <laughs> church people do weird things. So maybe you were called that at some point. Judas would betray Jesus. And we don't get very many glimpses into who Judas is, but we do get a couple throughout scripture that tell us not just what he was like, but who he was. So in John 13, you see Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. And in John chapter 12, right before this, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. And it says that a woman comes to him named Mary and she has a bottle of perfume, very expensive. And she breaks this over Jesus's feet. So she breaks it over his feet to anoint his feet. And she starts washing his feet with her hair, which may sound weird to you, but you think of how humble that is to do that. A little side tangent here. Do you notice the only person that washes Jesus's feet is a woman? Do you notice that? Last service I said that, it was about this response to you. And one of the ladies afterwards was like, yeah, we already know that, duh. Like, of course it was a woman. We, <laughs> us men are just as surprised. Oh, cool, okay. Washing her feet. And in the midst of this beautiful offering, it's like what we talked about when we were talking about ordering your finances God's way. She brings her first and her best to God. And it's probably still not enough, but God is so honored by a humble sacrifice. And in the midst of this, one of the disciples speaks up. And in John chapter 12, it says this, one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who would later betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? Why not? Why didn't we sell this to get this poor? It's worth a whole year's wages. And then we get insight into his motive because it sounds like a really good, like, hey, are you serious? We're going to pour all this money out? You could give that to the poor, you know. But you see the motive underneath it. And the motive says this. It says he did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As a keeper of the money bag, as the treasurer, he used to help himself to what was put into it. What you see here is a picture of a spirit that, can we be honest, is still alive and well and breathing and running and causing a mess today. And it's this, it's a spirit of perceived holiness masking a hidden subversive agenda, masking a personal agenda of gain. It's this picture of piety it goes, well, why would, we, why would we be so wasteful when there's poor people out here that could use some help internally Come on, he's a big hypocrite. You know this, right? He's sitting there going, no, no, no. But, but, but if we had that money, I could take a little cut out of that. You know how that shows up today? Because really, underneath it, it's actually just a judgmental spirit. So how this shows up today is someone that they get saved and another person sees it and goes, man, that's awesome that they're saved, but we'll see. We'll see. Time will tell if they actually, like, okay, so you pray to prayer, but we'll see if you're actually a Christian and if you actually, you see what I'm saying? There's some spirit of fear underneath that. I don't, I don't, we don't have time to talk about that today. But that spirit is alive and well, even today. And in fact, it's this interaction right here that drives Judas into the hands of the Pharisees. So Judas says this, and he says, we should give this money to the poor. And Jesus doesn't yell at him, but he does look at him sternly and say, hey, leave her alone. 
Are you kidding me? What she's doing is beautiful and right. You will always have the poor among you. If you're worried about the poor, don't worry, dude. They'll be around. They're still going to be here. But what she's doing is beautiful because I'm headed to my death. And it makes him so mad that he goes to the Pharisees in the next couple of verses and he literally says to them, how much will you give me if I give you Jesus? How much? How much will you give? Notice money is at the root of this again, just an interesting point. How much will you give me to do this? So we get to the table in John 13 and Judas is sitting with the other disciples and Jesus has washed all of their feet and they're reclining at the table and it says in verse 21, it says it this way. It says, after Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit and he testified, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, one of you will betray me and hand me over. One of you will betray me and hand me over. Now, context matters here because if you read this, you think Jesus is speaking this over the whole group going, hey, one of y'all is gonna betray me. I just want you to know that. It's gonna be one of you soon. No, no, no. One of the commentaries I read put it so beautiful this week. It said it this way. It said that, remember, they're not sitting at a high top table, but they're reclining down low. And when you read this, it says that John, the one who would write the book of John, was reclining and leaning on Jesus. So he was up in Jesus' grill, leaning back this way, sitting here. And Jesus says, I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. And John looks up at him and goes, Jesus, who's going to betray you? Which one of us is it going to be? And he would say, well, you know who's going to betray you? The one who takes the bread that I give after I've dipped it. That's going to be the one who betrays me. And he takes a piece of bread and he dips it and he turns and he hands it to Judas. And it says, it says, after Judas had taken the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, what you're going to do, do it quickly without delay. Now, again, if you read that, you might think he's going, hey, Judas, what you're going to go do, go do it quickly, dude. Go get it done. Again, you got to think about this. They're reclining at a table. Jesus is close enough to not only have somebody leaning on him, but to be leaning on somebody as well. And so he's sitting there and he takes a piece of bread and dips it. And here's the crazy part about what Jesus is doing here. All throughout this chapter, you see appeals of love towards Jesus or Judas over and over and over again. Dipping a piece of bread and handing it was a symbol in that day of friendship. I'm taking the choice morsel and I'm giving it to my friend, which just makes the betrayal so much worse, doesn't it? giving it to my friend. He'd have to have been close enough that he could actually pass it to the person. And so some scholars believe that Judas was actually sitting on his left, which would have been the place of honor. As if Jesus started the meal by saying, hey, wait, real quick, you come sit right here next to me. There's appeal after appeal after appeal made to Judas. And you know what's amazing? The more that the humble, helpful servant of all serves Jesus, or serves Judas, the more angry G Judas gets. Do you see this? The more that he extends an offering of friendship, come sit in this place of honor and come sit by me, the more angry he gets to the point where when Jesus takes this piece of friendship and gives it to him, it's what allows Satan to enter him. Do you see this? He hands him the bread and says Satan entered him. And real quick, notice how Satan enters him. He doesn't show up in the room in a red jumpsuit with a pitchfork, does he? He doesn't do it. He does it. Judas's head isn't spinning around and vomiting everywhere, right? Like notice... How does he show up? It says he entered him. He came in through his mind. He came in through his heart. What does it say at the beginning of the chapter? The devil had already put the thought into the mind of Judas. You know how those thoughts start? It starts with this. Well, what does this guy know? What's he think? What's he doing? I'm actually, you know, this, this woman who's coming up here and she's pouring out her offering on the ground. Like, can you believe her? Man, I thank God that I'm not like that guy. You see what I'm saying? And it's rooted all throughout this. And really underneath it is a spirit of pride that is blinding Judas to what Jesus is doing around the table. The very act of friendship gets distorted by pride into an offense. Do you see this? Here's the deal. We, uh, be careful how I say this. There are those that would say, hey, there's about four or five socially unacceptable sins that we need to hold up. And can you believe that those people are dealing with that or doing this or they're stuck in this or, or at least I'm not like that guy doing this. What about the sin of pride? Can we talk about that? The sin of pride. Some of you don't get this yet. C.S. Lewis talked about this in Mere Christianity when he said it this way. He said, listen, unchastity, anger, greed, drunkenness, any of the fruits of the flesh found in Galatians 5, all of them are mere flea bites in comparison. 
Comparison to what? Well, I'm glad you asked. It was through pride that the devil became the devil. Think about this. Pride leads to every other vice. Like it shows up in this way, but the thing underneath it is a spirit that says, no, I know what's right, and I know what to do, and that's not right, and no, I know how to follow God, and that's not of God. Do you see what I'm saying underneath that? There is a spirit of pride. It says pride is the complete anti-God state of mind. Judas is filled by Satan in this moment. And I wish I had time to just go verse by verse with you on this, but just like Peter, Judas has a breaking moment as well too, where he comes to the end of his self. And it comes when he's watching Jesus being beaten and tried and taken away. And while that's happening, despite the prideful attitude, shame hits him. And it says that he goes to the Pharisees and he takes the money and he gives it back to the Pharisees. And he says, guys, let him go, take the money back, do this. And what do the Pharisees do? Because you know the Pharisees had one of two choices, right? They could either believe him or they could kill him. And so they killed him. And they look at him and they say, hey, um, that's on you, dude. That's on you. That's not on us. That's on your conscience. You go deal with that. And Judas takes matters into his own hands and he ends his life. Pause. Pause. Jesus is sitting around the table and he's down washing the feet of his disciples and he's looking up into the eyes of the one who's going to betray him and he's washing his feet. Judas, I know you're going to betray me and I know that me even washing your feet right now, it's making you so mad. But can I be clear, your response doesn't dictate or change my willingness to come wash your feet. I'm still coming to you. I'm still going to wash your feet. Just like Peter, I'll wash your feet. You see, in this story, you see two wildly different disciples, yet eerily similar. You see a spirit of pride present in both of them. And you see a consistent, calm, non-anxious presence in Jesus, the humble, helpful servant of all washing their feet. Do you notice whose feet he washes? This is why if anybody ever tells you, well, Jesus only washed some people's feet, not everybody's feet. Are you kidding me? Do you know who's sitting around the table? That's crazy. That one of the guys is actively betraying him and he's washing their feet. Jesus is so consistent time and time again, pre, during, and post crucifixion. And that's such good news. Can I tell you why this is such good news? Because when I read this, if I was brutally honest with myself, it's this, is that when I read it, I am Peter and I am Judas. That I'm actually both. There's a tendency in us that when we read about these characters, we want to identify with one and demonize the other. Come on, you know this to be true. I'm both of them. You're both of them. We are both. Scripture says it this way, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Do you know what that means? We've sinned knowingly and unknowingly. Like there are things that we have done that we took matters into our own hands and we did it and we knew it was wrong and we did it anyway. And there are things that we did out of an anxious mind that I would have never shown up that way if I hadn't been, you know, as bent out of shape as I was, but I did and I still sinned. You see what I'm saying? That Jesus comes for both and says, hey, I'm going to wash the feet of those who would knowingly and unknowingly turn their backs on me. On the betrayer and the denier, I'm coming to wash their feet. That what you do has nothing to do with whether I'm going to come wash your feet or not. Actually, the decision is going to be on you as to when I wash your feet, will you receive this or not? Will you receive this or not? Are you going to be too proud to receive this? Because you see wildly different endings to the story, but eerily similar. I heard a pastor say this. You want to know the difference between Peter and Judas? It's 48 hours. It's 48 hours. And at the end of the 48 hours, there's a decision that's made by one that isn't made by the other. And it's a decision to a question that's this. When I come to the end of myself, where will I abide? Where will I abide? Where will I remain When I come to the end of the fact that, man, even at my best, (laughs) I am still hopelessly, desperately lost in my own sin. Even at my best, where will I go? Will I take matters into my own hands? Or will I come to the humble, helpful servant of all that says, hey, I've just been waiting for you here. I want to wash your feet again. 
You see, here's the beauty of this. And I told you I would get seriously practical last week about this today. The truth is when I recognize that the humble, helpful servant of all washes my feet when I'm Peter and I'm Judas, I notice this, that when I abide in the humble, helpful servant of all, I become like the humble, helpful servant of all. Here's what I mean by that. The cross shatters pride. Do you know this? It shatters pride. First Corinthians says that the cross is foolishness to the proud because the proud still believe that they can earn their way to God or do something that will make him happy enough. And the humble say, no, God, it's you. God, it's you who've done everything for me. So what, is, what does abiding look like practically? Because it's, it's not just thought. Let me tell you how practical this gets in light of what we're talking about. It's this, that every single day, no off days around here, every single day, I sit down in the presence of God and I start this way and I say, God, before I even get into your word, I thank you this morning. I thank you for all of the things that I'm proud of. God, I thank you for my beautiful wife and I thank you for my boys and my kids and our house. God, I'm so thankful for our house. God, I'm thankful for my job and that I get to do what I get to do. And I'm thankful for Heartland Church and the people of Heartland Church. It's the best church in the whole world. I thank you for just the countless people that are coming to know you over and over and over again through what we get to do here. And God, I thank you that none of those things are the basis of my righteousness. Like God, just thank you that that all of those conditional things, none of them, they're, they're just flea bites compared to what your work did for me on the cross. Thank you, God. And God, here are the areas that I need to bring to you that I'm not proud of. God, when I was sharp with my tongue and I didn't represent you in the way I should have. I'm sorry for that, God. Thank you for pointing that out to me. God, when I had that thought that I didn't want to have, I didn't mean for that to happen, but God, I just bring that to you anyway. And I say, I'm abiding in you again. I come to you over and over and over again. God, for the places that I don't even know about, I pray that when I read your scripture, you would speak to my heart and show me. Search me, God, and know me. Test my thoughts and see if there's anything offensive in you. Lead me in the way of your everlasting. This is what abiding looks like. Every single day. God, you are the basis of my righteousness. Not only do I not have anything to prove, but now with my pride shattered. Because <laughs> let's be really clear. The gospel's so offensive. Do you know this? It really is. Anybody who tries to tell you it's not, they don't have a clear picture of it. Because the gospel says this, on your best day. Your best day. Some of you go, what does my best day look like? When you are crushing it in the year in the Bible. Like you're crushing it. Like you made it through Leviticus. Way to go. You did it. Praise God. You made it through numbers. And now you're in Deuteronomy. Let's go. I endured. I fought the good fought. Let's go. Like we're pressing on to see, you know. When I don't yell at my kids. When I say, gosh darn it, instead of the alternative. You know what I'm saying? Oh, y'all don't do that? Okay, cool. Sweet. When... I serve someone out of a place of just humility. On your best day, the cross stands there and says, hey, can I be really clear? You could not pay for your own sin. That you couldn't do it on your own. That in fact, I had to send my son to do what you couldn't do so that you could receive what only I could give you. The cross humbles, it shatters. In fact, when I abide in Christ, I'm just reminded again and again That humility is the greatest virtue in the kingdom of heaven. That if I want to become like the humble, helpful servant of all, then God, bring me to my knees again daily over what I'm doing and where I'm going. Andrew Murray, he was a writer in the 1800s, a Christian writer, thinker. He said it this way, so good in a book called Humility, The Pursuit of Holiness. He says it this way, he says, men sometimes speak as if humility and meekness would rob us of what is noble and bold and manlike. Can we be clear? That's the world outside of here. And that's the world inside of here. Can we be really clear? They want to pretend that if you're humble, if you're meek, if you're gentle, well, then you're not going to be able to be a real man. Look what it says here. Oh, that all would believe that this is the nobility of the kingdom of heaven. This is the nobility of following Jesus, that you would be the humble, helpful servant of all, that this royal spirit, let's be really clear, not a weak spirit, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, the royal spirit would be displayed, the king of heaven, it would be displayed, that this is God-like. Like, you wanna know how close you are to God? How humble are you? 
to humble oneself, to become the servant of all. That God, my whole life is in submission to you. God, I'm humbled by the fact that when I was Peter and when I was Judas, you washed my feet. I thank you that tomorrow, when I'm Peter again, you're still gonna wash my feet. I thank you that later tonight, when I'm Judas, you still wash my feet and you still call me back and you still call me higher. You say, come on, climb higher, grow, learn. Who you're becoming is more important than what you're doing. Let me show you a better story on the other side than just this moment of failure right now. And you know what's amazing about this? This picture of Jesus washing feet, it is a microcosm. It's a, it's a small foreshadowing of what Jesus would do on the cross. Because in a matter of hours, Jesus would move from washing feet to stretching his arms out on a cross and being crucified. And my hope is this, is that this week during Holy Week, you would have just a few still small moments in the presence of God where you could reflect and encounter what Jesus endured for you. That you would see this, that all of you at some point would go walk the way of the cross out here that we have back here. It's 15 scriptural stations of the cross. And there's something about interacting with scripture in person when you see it, that it speaks to you so deeply. So you start the beginning of the way of the cross and you're out there and you see the humble, helpful servant of all go into the garden. And he says, Father, not my will, but your will be done. He's moved to the point where he's sweating drops of blood. And some of you go, wow, he must have been so uh, anxious about the physical punishment he was going to endure. That's a portion of it. But I was talking to my dad, PD, about it today, that he was actually going to take on the darkness of the world. He was going to, for the first time in his life, be separated from the Father. And as you watch, you see Jesus say, but God, your will be done, not mine. That as he's beaten... He's silent like a sheep before the shears, enduring a greater purpose. That as his arms are stretched out and they're nailing him into the cross and mocking him, he's saying, Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. And at the very end, he's on a cross and he says, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. It's finished. And you look at this and you go, well, how could he endure that? How could he do that? There's this beautiful part in Hebrews where he says this way. It says, Jesus Christ, who endured the cross for the joy set before him. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. What's the joy, you ask? The joy is this, and it's the same joy that we're invited to. When you finish the way of the cross, you finish station 14 where Jesus is put into the tomb, and you come around on the resurrection memorial, you walk in, and on the walls, you can't miss it real big, it says this from John 11, it says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Can I tell you what the joy that was set before him was? Why he washed feet, why he went to the cross, why he endured its shame, why? For the joy set before him, it was you. And it was me. And it was all of us. And it was this picture of a table, like the one that he was sitting around where we would be united with him. Where he would look and he'd say, do you know how much I love you? Do you love me? Yeah, I love you too. Come and eat with me. Come and sit with me. And what I love about that, and it's so clear, it says, I am the resurrection and the life. Not I was the resurrection and the life. Not that I'm going to be someday, but I am right now. Which is such good news, because how many of you know that the power of Jesus doesn't just get me to heaven someday, but the same resurrected power of Jesus can bring dead things in my life back to life right now today. That he works, that he's a master at resurrecting things that we've rolled stones over and we say, no, that's dead, that's done. That dream, gone. No, that relationship, gone. And Jesus would go, no, 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 have you, have you heard about the breath of life that I have? Go, look at my hands, what I did for you. Look at the stone that was rolled away. Come on, I bring dead things back to life. And before we close, I, I just, I'm struck by this, that for many of us, when we get closer to the humble, helpful servant of all, we become the helpful servant of all. I can't help but wonder, what if you have been placed in the position of life that you're in with your family, with your job, with your friends, with your circle of influence, not to gain power, not to gain promotion, not to gain popularity. 
What if you were placed into that position to be the humble, helpful servant of all that would point people to the presence and the power of a resurrected king? What if the reason you're there is simply, as Jesus would say, Jesus would say, hey, you're to be salt and light. Salt and light change everything that it touches. And Jesus says, go and be my witnesses. You know how freeing that statement is right there? I don't need you to go be my defendant. I can defend myself. <laughs> I don't need you to be the judge. Surely you're not that. I don't need you to be the jury. I don't need you to even be a bystander. I need you to be a witness and tell of your experience. I need you to go to a world around you that's hemorrhaging in pain and look at them and say, hey, I know you're hurting right now. Can I just tell you that the same God that raised Jesus from the dead has raised dead things in my life as well too. Here's where I was and where God has brought me out of. Can I tell you, on a week like what we're getting ready to go into, the world around us is more hungry and receptive to the power of Jesus than ever before. Let me be clear, not receptive to just another church service or to a religious experience. No, 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 no. Receptive and waiting for an encounter with the living, present, resurrected God who wants to speak to their heart. I wonder who God has put in your proximity that needs a touch, that needs a resurrection. And I know that in a room this size and watching online, there's somebody here today that would sit and say, Nick, I'm in need of resurrection. I know that. God, I know that I need you. And if that's you, can I tell you, what does it say at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount? God blesses, like God works and moves and breathes in the life of people who recognize their need for God, who are poor in spirit enough to go, God, I don't even know how I need you, but I know that I need you. And I believe that God can meet you here today, right now, in this moment. Let me pray for you. Father God, I love you. And Jesus, I thank you for your resurrection. God, I thank you that you're the humble, helpful servant of all. God, I thank you that you moved towards me before I ever even knew that I needed you to. And God, I thank you for your power and your work in our lives. God, thank you for washing my feet, not just with water, God, but with your precious blood that covers so perfectly on the cross. And if that's you today and you're sitting around and you say, Nick, I know that I need God. I've been living my life without him and I know that I need him today. I don't even know how, but I know that I need him. Accepting Jesus into your life is easy as just asking him to come in. And if that's you, I wanna give you words to say in a prayer and I want you to pray with me. But with every head bowed, all eyes closed across this room, if that's you, say, Nick, today's the day I need to accept Jesus into my life. If that's your decision today, just raise your hand across this room. I wanna pray for you. Yep, I see you right in the middle. Yes, sir. Up in the side. Yes, I see you. Yes, yes. Beautiful. Yep, over to the side. All over. Yes. Sitting up front. Yep. Up in the risers. Come on, God's talking to somebody. Beautiful. It's amazing. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Come on, if you're watching online right now, just raise your hand where you're at. God knows. He sees you. Say these words with me. Say this. Say, Jesus, Lord, I need you. I'm sorry for doing things on my own, for taking matters into my own hands. But today I ask that you would come into my life. I thank you for dying for me, for giving me new life, for giving me a new purpose. Say this part, say, Jesus, today I ask you to come into my life. Father, I thank you for every person that just prayed that prayer. God, I pray that right now, where they're sitting, God, they would feel your presence tangibly like never before. God, they know that you made them, you created them, that you love them, and God, you have a purpose for their life greater than they could imagine. Lord, I ask in the mighty name of Jesus that you would change them. God, help them to see you, that they would never be the same. We love you, Father. What a privilege to sit in your presence. It's in Jesus' name that we all sit together. Amen. Amen. Come on, praise God. It's amazing. I love you guys.